Hi, this is uh, Howie Foreman at the Yale School of Management. Um, happy to be introducing an amazing panel today on uh, COVID-19 with our uh, distinguished faculty members uh, who I will introduce in just a minute, Ed Kaplan, James Hamblin, um, and Jason Abeluk. Um, and I first want to just uh, say thank you to all the people who are attending. I know uh, that in our lives right now, this may seem almost overwhelming to be constantly bombarded with uh, talk about COVID-19, but we're hoping to bring an enlightening perspective on that with three very different uh, speakers and both, all three um, experts in this area. I also want to just make a quick shout out to the Broad Center who are joining us as well. We're very proud of a collaboration with them that is beginning uh, um, at this time. And uh, we're, we're sorry that everything that we're doing is so virtual, but we're happy to be able to bring them into our, our family and have them join this event today. Um, I'm just going to start off with just a couple of quick moments of uh, summary of where we are right now. We're, in what has been described as a global pandemic for several weeks right now. We're still seeing variable responsiveness by uh, states, municipalities, cities, and so on uh, within the United States and throughout the world. Um, every nation seems to be approaching this slightly differently, but I think one thing that we can all agree right now is that the more limited um, amount of activity in a given city seems to eventually within about two or three three weeks result in less um, uh, case presentations and ultimately a few weeks after that, fewer deaths to present. And the later that we seem to be waiting to reduce that activity through various types of lockdowns and social distancing, uh, the more deaths that we seem to be seeing. Um, and so we, there's so many questions that still remain to be answered about how we're going to approach this going forward. This is not a sprint, this is a marathon. Uh, and it's very important that everybody, including our community, is as enlightened as possible about this. We are so fortunate to have our three experts with us. Um, Ed Kaplan, my friend and colleague at the School of Management for all the time that I've been here, um, is a, a professor of engineering and operations research and in the School of Public Health and multiple other disciplines. Um, and is one of the uh, few duly elected members of the National Academy of Medicine and the National Academy of Engineering, uh, and who has been doing modeling about um, infectious disease outbreaks for decades now, uh, probably even preceding the HIV outbreak in the 1980s, but obviously continuing through to anthrax, smallpox, um, and now COVID-19. And he was one of the most thoughtful voices um, at the beginning of, uh, of our attention to this. So I'm going to first turn it over to him to give some background about sort of how he sees this and the multiple hats he's been wearing uh, to cover this topic for the community, for government, um, and for society at large. And then we'll move on to each other's speaker. So thank you very much for joining us, Professor Kaplan. Thank you, Howie. Uh, good afternoon. I, I uh, hope, that, hope that we're all doing well. I'm going to try and share a, a, to share a few slides to explain how it was that uh, actually. So can everyone see the slide? Um, I actually, I got involved with COVID in a big way. Uh, through Yale University uh, because I was tapped to be on the University Advisory Committee, which was formed at the very end of February, beginning of March, to help guide the university through the decisions uh, it faced as a result of this outbreak. And the membership of the committee is on the slide in front of you. It's chaired by the, uh, by the director of Yale Health, Paul Jennison. It includes the deans of the nursing, the public health, and the medical schools, infectious disease experts, hospital experts, uh, we have the director of the New Haven Health Department and yours truly. Uh, we operate with daily morning phone calls uh, all, all week long uh, and uh, have been working very hard uh, to try and provide good support for the university in this process. When to keep the university open, uh, decisions to move all of the classes online, to move the students off campus, things of this nature. One of the things I'm proudest of is that we helped to kickstart numerous critical public health activities at Yale. 
That includes getting our own testing labs up at the Yale School of Medicine when it became clear there wasn't enough testing. Uh, in two weeks flat, we went from nothing to having the ability to do our own testing of, uh, for patients in the hospital. Um, and a number of other things. Now, so timing decisions is really what I've been spending most of my time on now. The first positive case at Yale happened over spring break, and there was a decision quickly to move teaching online, not to bring the students back. But the question was, how long is this outbreak going to last? Is there a possibility of having graduation, a possibility of summer schools and activities? The hospitals want to know when cases might go over capacity. The governor wants to know the potential outcomes of different interventions, as does the mayor. In order to help answer these questions, one requires the ability to generate sensible scenarios to get insight into what's going on. And I just wanted to uh, add here that uh, all of these scenarios are not statistical forecasts, they're not predictions, these are not curve fitting exercises. One of the metaphors I hear very misused in this is people say, this is a wave, this epidemic is a wave, a tidal wave, a tsunami, we just have to hunker down until it washes over us. But that's of course a misnomer because we're driving this wave, what we do as a society is going to change the timing, the extent, and the shape of it. And so that's really what the modeling is for, to try and understand what the likely consequences are of different interventions to figure out how to act now, as opposed to try to make exact predictions on what will happen when. Uh, the last thing is that uh, there are some very practical and important concerns that I've recently gotten involved with. Most important, I think, is standing up community testing. This is so important to try and understand uh, how we can actually take advantage of tests as they become available, get out into the community, find out who is infected, separate and isolate infected people from susceptibles. That is our best hope at trying to actually end this thing earlier and get out of this cycle of, of uh, lockdown and lift up and, and repeat the uh, the, the, uh, these extreme measures. There are a couple of other issues which come up. Uh, one is we actually have a group led by Professor Jordan Petri in the engineering school, which is sampling sludge from the New Haven wastewater treatment plant, uh, effluent from Union Station, effluent from the uh, hospital, basically doing environmental monitoring for COVID, uh, hopefully uh, to give us an early sign of when this might be waning in the community and also to supplement our attempts at surveillance because we don't have enough testing to do proper community uh, surveillance. And then finally, everybody knows that uh, testing for COVID is woefully incomplete. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, if one thinks very hard about how the testing process actually works, it might be possible to correct this. Essentially, people who are symptomatic are getting tested, and there are plenty of people who have symptoms that look exactly like COVID getting tested. We need to know more about what the natural incidence of those folks are, unexplained flu, unexplained fever, this sort of thing. And so we're working on that right now to try and go back and uh, correct the test counts. I think I've said enough and I apologize for my inadeptness with the screen control, so I'll hand it back to Howie. Oh, you're great. Thanks very much for, for opening with that. I'm going to move over to um, Jason Abeluk, who um, teaches in our uh, executive MBA program and our full-time MBA program on strategy and healthcare strategy. And um, he became immersed in this topic over the last several weeks, working with our colleague, uh, Judy Chevalier, um, and others to sort of address the big question about whether people on the street should be wearing uh, masks or not, or, or how should they be wearing masks and what types of masks. Um, and he's gotten be becoming, uh, become very invested in this specific topic, which I think is outside of his usual domain, but draws on his talents. So I'll let him explain a little bit about that first. Yeah, thanks, Holly. So um, I guess first I just wanted to uh, say a few words about how economists generally are thinking about the policy response to the pandemic. And it, the way I think about it is it's sort of like, so imagine that you are in London during World War II, someone was interviewing Winston Churchill and they're like, okay, Winston, you know, what are you prioritizing in your government's responses? And Winston was like, good question. So here's what we're thinking about, you know, with all the German bombings, since the city has been decimated, you know, restaurant owners, no one is going to restaurants anymore. So we really need to do something to support restaurant owners, the tellers, almost no one is buying a new suit. 
you know, because of all the bombing. So we definitely have to do something to support the tailors and the banks are the lifeblood of our economy. You know, if, if you don't have loans for a bank, you can't start a business. And so we definitely have to support the banks. And so we're going to authorize $2 trillion to do all that. And nothing he said is wrong. That's all well and good. But also his response is totally insane. Because while that $2 trillion in spending is immensely useful and should be there, there's a huge thing missing, which is if he responded that way, he's not doing anything to fight the Nazis. And that's by far the overwhelming policy priority. And we are in basically exactly the same situation where it, the, when we think of the policy response, it shouldn't be, oh, what can we do to support the flagging economy? It should be, what can we do to fight the spread of the virus? And there's a very precise economic sense in which, like, th th this is not just like an ethical judgment that economists have made. This is not just, well, you know, we think it's important that we protect elderly human lives or whatever. We do think that. But there's a very precise economic sense in which this is true, which is all the time we see people make spending decisions where they have to trade off money against health. So we know, in some sense, how people value reductions in their risks. When we apply those methods to the current status quo, we find that every household in the United States faces about $60,000 in mortality risk from COVID-19. So what does that $60,000 in mortality risk mean? $60,000 is about equal to annual median income. So that suggests that, look, Suppose by locking down the economy, we can reduce mortality risk by half. Then when would we break even? Well, we would break even if we reduce mortality risk by half. We save $30,000 per household. Well, you'd lock down for about, so if locking down the economy also reduces GDP by 50%, you'd lock, you'd lock down for a year. Okay, so what these calculations suggest is that it's a no-brainer that we should lock down the economy now in order to prevent people from dying because the reduced mortality risk vastly outweighs, at least unless this goes on for a year, any unless literally we were totally locked down for a year, any economic damage that is done by that. So the first point I want to make, I have a couple of graphs here, is that I'm not just saying this, every economist agrees with me about this. And when I say every economist, Literally, there was a poll of top economists, and they were unanimous. No one disagrees with the claim that first, the first question is abandoning severe lockdowns, the time when the likelihood of a resurgence in infections remains high, will lead to greater total economic damage than sustaining the lockdown to eliminate the resurgence of this. Nobody disagrees. A couple of people were like, well, we don't know anything, we're uncertain, and then the remainder of economists agreed or strongly agreed. Likewise, every economist agrees that optimally the government should be investing far more in things that directly fight the virus, building temporary hospitals, accelerating testing, making more masks, ventilators, providing financial incentives for the production of a successful vaccine. It is just insane that this has not been the main policy response. Okay, so let me just say a little bit. So we just what what might like the end game look like? I mean, I think the most likely end game is that we have lockdowns until we can get the infection rate down to the point where we can do some kind of test and trace to really contain the epidemic, make sure people who are infected are quarantined and everyone can go back to normal. What this means is that any policy that accelerates the time when that happens, any policy that reduces by even a small amount the spread of the virus will have overwhelming benefits. So one of the things that I've been working on, as Howie mentioned, is what are the benefits of universal mask adoption? And I think the key takeaway here, before we actually even think about the specific evidence about masks, is even a tiny reduction in the probability that people transmit the virus from one person to another has ridiculously huge economic benefits. So based on the numbers that I mentioned to you earlier, we calculated that look, if mass reduced by even 10%, which is much, much less than the best estimates from the scientific literature, but if mass reduced by 10%, the probability that an infected person transmits the virus to someone else, 
that would be worth between three and six thousand dollars per U.S. household. So three and six thousand dollars is a lot more than the price of a couple of cloth masks. So it seems like, man, everybody should be wearing masks when they go in public in order to try to slow the spread of the virus. So I'll just end with a quick econometrics lesson. I'll show you a, a graph that we made as part of this analysis. Of course, we are interested in trying to understand what is the impact of masks. My take on this is that the scientific literature suggests, so there's a bunch of lab studies where basically people who are infected with the virus wear masks and they cough on things and we try to measure the viral load and the things that they cough on. When we do these lab studies, we find that yes, it does appear that masks make it less likely that you will transmit the virus. They reduce the viral load and the things that you cough on. There's also a whole bunch of other studies about whether masks protect you. Those studies, I would say the results are much more ambiguous. They typically find nothing, but they might not have the statistical power to detect large effects. So I would say we don't know if they protect you. We do know we have very good evidence. They seem to reduce the probability that you transmit the virus. Another thing we can do is look across regions. We can look at places where people have norms that if they have even slight symptoms, they start to wear masks. So for example, in Japan, in South Korea, these are countries where if you become ill or you start sneezing and stuff, the norm is if you go out in public, you will wear a mask. And they've been doing that for a while. So one thing we see is, look, though in those countries, the virus has spread much more slowly. Now, there's a potential issue with this, which is whenever you do a cross-country comparison, there's many other things that could be different. OK, so in South Korea, we know that they did a lot more testing. And that's almost surely one of the reasons that they have had a less severe epidemic. In Japan, we know they have other norms aside from just wearing masks. For example, they don't do handshakes. They'll do other kinds of things that might reduce a bow or something that might reduce the spread of the virus. OK, so when you look at this cross-country evidence, you shouldn't be like, man, this is completely definitive. This suggests that masks absolutely will reduce by 50% the spread of the virus because the solid lines you see, those are the countries with mass norms. Well, the solid lines seem to have much slower growth. The light gray lines, they have no mass norms. They seem to be growing faster. There's other possible explanations, but nonetheless, I think this evidence is strongly suggestive because it looks like, hey, every country where people wear masks seems to be doing better than every country where they don't wear masks. And that holds if you compare them to other Asian countries. It holds, you know, you can, we tried other policy controls for like the timing of their lockdowns and stuff. It still seems to be there. So this seems to be pretty suggestive evidence that in fact, universal mask adoption would be effective. The reason for universal mask adoption is because we know there's all this asymptomatic spread. So there's all these people or pre-symptomatic spread at the very least. So there's all these people who are likely infected with the virus who don't know they're infected, so they don't have any symptoms, they're not gonna wear a mask unless everyone is wearing masks. So that's why we think probably like the returns to universal ma mask adoption, especially cloth masks are extremely large. I should just caveat this with, don't go out and buy N95 masks for yourself because there's also a desperate shortage of those for medical workers and they're probably a hundred times more valuable for every medical worker than they are for the average person. So you should be making homemade cloth masks until there's no longer a shortage of medical masks. All right. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, and last, I'm just gonna introduce uh, Dr. James Hamblin, who I've known for I think 13 years right now and is uh, perhaps the uh, leading physician voice um, in journalism and reporting on this topic and has had many pieces in the Atlantic that um, have been way ahead of the curve in educating the public about this outbreak. His earliest piece that I think struck a nerve with everybody was that you will likely get uh, the coronavirus. And I think his most recent pieces have been on hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine and, and the uh, evidence that supports their use or not use. Um, and I'm just going to let him have a couple of opening words here, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So while he's speaking, if people have questions, send them to us. And if you want to target it at one of the uh, speakers, uh, please uh, say that as well in your question. And I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Hamlin. Thanks so much, Howie. Um, yeah, I've, I'm an expert of nothing, virology, economics, um, any particular area. I'm a generalist, and I've been watching this since January and just trying to 
ask questions and keep the public informed and think about effective ways to do that without either causing panic or downplaying things. Um, and in January, I first um, started seeing real discrepancies in how you know countries were reacting to this and hearing the World Health Organization uh, praising China's you know e extreme lockdown measures and noting how vastly different uh, the U.S. policy responses were, and then started talking to mo disease modelers who um, were saying this could get really bad for us, and it felt like being sort of in the opening scenes of Jurassic Park where you n know that as a view you know something's going wrong and you're just watching us do no social distancing and no testing and. Um, so I felt I, I sort of fell then into a position of trying to um, raise some alarms, and some people thought it was too panicky. And now I wonder if it was um, urgent enough in the messaging. But um, <laughs> I've wondered that at every step, and just trying to do my best and thinking a lot about the the role of the media and how it can be improved to make sure that everyone feels like they're getting a. Uh, the facts that they need at a time when they can't trust a lot of people in power and that communication is so important to any emergency response, but especially a pandemic. That's all that I'll say. Great. Thanks very much. I'm going to start taking questions from the audience and I'll insert my own at times. I'm going to start with uh, the first question comes in and says, you know, as you sit there and I'm going to, um, I'll put this first to Professor Kaplan, but, but any of the panelists can weigh in. As you sit there considering um, all the data coming in and how biased it is in one way or the other in the sense that we're under testing, so we have limited understanding of what prevalence is in various communities and we have limited understanding. We don't even know precisely what R0 is. We, we don't know precisely what the case fatality rate will be. How do you factor that into your models and, and how do you think about that? I know Professor Kaplan has modeled infectious diseases for decades now. How do you work with uncertainty of this high degree? Hi, can you hear me? Thumbs up? Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's, it's a perfectly fair question. The first thing I will say is that obviously trying to do almost anything in real time with the kind of information we're seeing is not likely to meet with success because so many things are changing. Things are changing because testing rates are changing, which means that cases are detected at different rates. Things change because of individual human behavior, even in the absence of policy. People may decide on their own that they want to stay home more, or some people may decide that they don't care and try to expose themselves more. There are policies such as social distancing and lockdowns and so on. So when I do epidemiological modeling in outbreaks, uh, and that goes back to some of the ones that, that Howie had mentioned earlier, the idea is not to try and say, how do I calibrate a model so I can make the best predictions? That's actually not what I believe the purpose of these models really is. The purpose of these models is to help you drive your way through it by first establishing the basic transmission principles and ask yourself, what would the epidemic do to us? And it's possible to get a pretty good read on some of the early transmission based on going back to the very early reports out of Wuhan where people were observed to become infected and progress to symptoms and you could see what the growth rate in cases was and this was happening before in any interventions came in. And this is what epidemiologists try to do with outbreaks. You try to establish in some sense what the force of the infection itself is. And I would argue that there's actually quite a bit of consensus among epidemiologists for what, what that is. Usually that gets summarized in a number that many of you have heard before, something called the reproductive number. That is a estimate of the number of secondary transmissions that would come from an infected person surrounded by susceptibles. And estimates of that from many different sources seem to be coalescing in the 2.2 to 2.6 neighborhood. So of course that tells you why you have an exponentially growing epidemic in the first place. If each infected person is infecting say two and a half others, the thing is going to start to go. So now the question is, what do you do with that information? So I'll tell you what my approach is and not everyone would agree, but this is what I try to do. The first thing, as I said, is try to establish what an uncontrolled outbreak would look like. The second thing is to say, 
okay, what are the different levers that we have to push back on this? The uncontrolled outbreak says, here's what the epidemic can do to you. The policy decisions and the human behavior part of it say, what can we do to the epidemic? And so what we do is we take these models and we say, look, if we're going to have, as an example, a lockdown, how can you represent that in a model? Let me just take an extreme example. Suppose the lockdown was actually perfect. 100% of people simply went indoors. In the model, that's literally what you do. You take all of the susceptible people in the population and you send them on vacation for however long the lockdown is. There's still going to be some transmission that works itself out, but now the end of the lockdown, in the model, you send everybody back again. What happens? There are still infected people out there. All you've done is reset the initial conditions and the whole thing is going to reignite. And model after model after model has shown you that effect. So uh, that, that, that's one thing you do with the models. But what the models can also do is help you understand what it takes to drive your way out of this mess. And that's very important. We don't have a vaccine. We don't really have drugs at this point, which, which will uh, help people get through uh, milder courses of disease. Of course, there are many candidates for that and people are looking at them. Uh, even if you had a drug whose main effect was to shorten the length of stay in the ICU by a day or two, that would be a huge win because it would increase the rate at which people could, could be admitted. So what you do is you experiment with these things and ask yourself, what are controls that you could have which would actually help drive your way out of it? My own view on this is that uh, the way to drive your way out of this has to do with massive testing to detect infected persons and isolate them early in the course of their infection. That's a massive task. It's a massive task in terms of the logistics of actually trying to screen communities. And it's also a massive task in terms of the isolation because most of this would be at home isolation. There are some people whose living situations are such that it wouldn't even be necessarily feasible to do this. This calls for the need to have actual isolation facilities and so forth. There's a lot that has to be done, but it is doable. And what the models show is that if, for example, you could isolate, say, 80% of the population right around the time they were having symptoms or even earlier, that actually would be enough to put you below the epidemic threshold. That actually would be enough not to just get a temporary win from a lockdown. That could actually make the whole thing disappear. So there are ways out, but they're very, very difficult ways out. And in terms of you know, just, just curve fitting and projections, of course it's important to have situational awareness. Of course it's important to say, where are we going uh, in the short term? There are many, many different models that are out there, as I'm sure you know. Some of them are much more public than others. Some of them are essentially just curve fitting exercises like the one from the University of Washington that is based on curve fitting mortality. Uh, others are, are more epidemiologically grounded. But my view, the whole reason why we do this is not to try and make accurate predictions so at the end you turn back and say, who got it right? Who had the scorecard? Actually, if you act on the information that's presented in an epidemic model, you should never get it right because you should change your future and things should work out differently as a result. So um, Jason, can I ask you, uh, it's obvious to you right now that our very aggressive lockdown makes sense. There obviously is some point based on some future point where the, the epidemic wave has waned sufficiently. How do you think about that? What, how do you deal with something? As, as Professor Kaplan has said, we're in a situation where the, um, you know, Everything we do, first of all, has a lag, and everything we do changes the model that we're currently existing in, or at least changes the outcomes that the model represents. How are you thinking about that in terms of dynamically responding to uh, where we are in the outbreak? Yeah, uh, well, first, I think Ed's point about this is exactly right, that it's a question of what technologies are available to us at any given point. So right now, the key issue is, you know, we're just not doing enough testing. We still don't even know how many people are infected. We don't know the extent of the epidemic. In uh, we don't we don't have good estimates of the mortality rates. We don't have good estimates of the extent of the epidemic. So I think before we remove lockdowns, the first priority is just to get a much better sense of a what are the actual mortality rates. B how many people are actually currently infected. Then I think the I think the most likely end game is 
once you have a good sense of that, if the mortality rates do in fact fall where we think they do. There is one very optimistic scenario that I would say I think is relatively unlikely but not impossible, which is that in fact far more people than we think are infected and the mortality rates are much, much lower than we think they are. In that case, we need to reevaluate our policy response. And the way we would figure that out is by doing basically random testing. If you know, in every state in the United States, we suddenly, instead of saying, we're only gonna test the people with symptoms, we randomly test a thousand people and we find out, oh man, it turns out 30% of people are already infected. It's just that many people are infected with mild symptoms. We vastly overstated the mortality rate. What we should do is just let everyone get infected now and get herd immunity and that's the right answer. That's a possibility, I think it's unlikely. I think the more likely thing is we do all that testing, we find that the mortality rate is roughly in the range that we expect, which is pretty high. And then what we need to do is we need to say, okay, there's basically two possible end games. End game one is that via lockdowns, we, so first we get the infection rate less than, the, or the reproduction number less than one so that the number of infected people is falling. Ideally, we get it far less than one so that the number of infected people falls to the point where given the existing testing technology, we can move to this second regime. We can move to this regime where we're going to say the following. We're going to say we are anyone who remotely has symptoms and ideally even everyone, but we're going to test people. If you test positive, we test as many people as we possibly can. You test positive, you're quarantined immediately. We're also then going to figure out from your cell phone. Uh, there's important issues of privacy that we could get into. We're going to figure out from your cell phone everyone you were possibly in contact with and we're going to tell them, hey, you should also quarantine for 14 days. So basically, we will end the total society-wide lockdown. We'll all go back to work, but anyone who tests positive or was near someone who tested positive will be immediately quarantined. And hopefully, if our testing technology is good enough, that is enough to keep the reproduction number less than one. And that, I think, is the most likely end game. The other thing that we should concurrently be doing is just massively investing in expediting the trials and everything else necessary to get vaccines approved. Because uh, I'm actually somewhat optimistic. There's, I think if you, if you read in the press, you often see people say, oh, it can take 12 to 18 months to develop a vaccine, which I think is normally true. I think because there are so many parties like who understand the urgency of this, I'm hopeful that, a, that something will come out sooner. But anything we can do to expedite that, if we can pay, 10 times as much money to recruit 10 times as many participants in the trial so that it finishes twice as fast. It's an absolute no brainer that we should do that because the other way that things can end is basically to say, okay, you know, we're going to do lockdowns. We're going to try to get our, the reproduction number low. We're going to do this test and trace, but maybe we fail at that. Maybe things come back, but it's when a vaccine happens that that pattern of us failing and the epidemic returning that ends for good. Thank you. I'm going, to, I'm going to let Ed opine here because he, he has a couple of quick points to get in and then I'm going to come back to Dr. Hamlin. Well, the, I, I think Jason is right in his basic idea. Um, I think the important thing to remember here is that in order to actually do massive testing uh, requires planning out how you're actually going to do it. There are tremendous logistics involved in this. Everyone right now is sort of at home. So if we're going to do community testing, and by the way, a negative test doesn't mean, oh, I'm fine. A negative test means you're fine for now. So if you say that you're going to screen the population at 10%, literally what that means is every person is getting tested every 10 days, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, and that's a huge, huge effort. So I'm, uh, right now, what I'm trying to advocate is somewhat of a middle ground. Yes, it's important to try and understand a better picture of what the actual spread is, but you also want to find infected people very quickly. So where can we screen in the community in a situation like this where you're likely to have a more representative sample than you find in people with symptoms? Jason's absolutely right about that. But at the same time, going door to door is probably not feasible, although actually in certain locations, it, it might actually be the case that you do have to do that. So think about things like this. How about screening in grocery stores? How about screening at gas stations? How about screening at other sentinel sites where people actually, even in this kind of period, are out and about? Now, it's not 
easy, but it's also not impossible to do this, especially with some of the new technologies, which I'll let Howie and James talk about, uh, that are coming on board. These are rapid tests, and so the idea of having to, you know, ship everything off to a lab and, and, and wait a day or two uh, wouldn't be an issue. So there's just this massive logistics part. But the second part that I wanted to uh, reinforce that Jason said, anybody, anybody who has the slightest symptom at all should be able to go get tested. The reason for this is that what the earlier work has shown, and this again goes back to the early transmission dynamics analysis, that modeling suggested that about 20% of transmission is occurring before symptoms. If people simply were able to get screened and actually isolate right at about the time they have symptoms or even a little bit later, that by itself would be enough to push the reproductive number below one. But on the other hand, you're not going to get 100% of the people this way, but you could get a very large percentage of the people this way if, in fact, there was sufficient capacity. So it's these two things. You want to make it possible for anybody who gets who has symptoms to get tested, and you want to think very, very hard and work very, very quickly to get the logistics together so you can actually do the massive kind of intervention that Jason's talking about. And the cell phones actually is another great idea, but but I, I don't want to keep talking. Thanks. James, um, you know, nobody has talked to more people from more different points of view than you have in your writing on this topic. Um, and I would love to hear like, where does hope come from and where does your, where does doom and gloom come from? Because you've talked to people on both extremes and maybe since, since uh, Ed talked about new technologies coming along, what are the things that get you excited right now that give you hope that, you know, the world is not coming to an end? Mm -hmm. I, I'm very interested by the serology testing. I hope that I have had the virus and that I'm totally immune. There's new data I just saw today that uh, uh, I believe is in Japan, a study that there was, or China, uh, the study that there was actually low um, antibody levels in people who'd been diagnosed. Um, and that was concerning to me. Um, so, I'm hoping, I, I take hope in the small things that people are doing to take care of one another and in the immobilization that has happened in certain areas and in the ingenuity I'm seeing around people um, creating facilities and actually adhering to social distancing and actually a lot of bipartisanship on, um, with a few outliers, you know, that you don't see um, around uh, almost any other uh, at, at any other time, but it's difficult to understand it as this ongoing tragedy that is not w w where there are extreme losses that are not preventable. You can choose sort of how we allocate those losses, more financial, more in terms of human health and lives, um, but to, to simply um, you know, there, there is no perfect solution. So I'm, um, but I, I'm heartened by how many people know, now know the term epidemiologist. That does seem to be the uh, word of the year, as I think you pointed <laughs> out, or somebody else pointed out, is, uh, is one of those words that everybody seems to know right now. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask a question to Jason, sort of a, a sort of a macro question a little bit, and, and also just about the modeling. Um, we're clearly seeing different waves in the country right now in the same way that the world has seen different waves. And how do you think about decision-making on the local versus the national level when you're dealing with a, a globe, you know, not just a global economy, but you know, the United States functioning as an integrated economy. And we see right now Georgia just approaching a peak and having a massive outbreak right at the same time that New York is plateauing. How do you, think about decision-making about airports and air travel and so on. The president suggested a quarantine of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut uh, just two weeks ago. How should we be thinking about this? Yeah, I mean, I think on the one hand, there's no question that having a coordinated federal response would be extremely helpful. Like I think Steve Berry, one of our colleagues in the econ department tweeted that it's like, how about we form some kind of confederation of states that will work together 
to combat this epidemic when they decide, you know, when to, how to allocate, how to purchase medical equipment and things like that. We can call it the United States. And then, you know, that might help. And of course, there are a huge number of reasons that uh, that, that would be beneficial, both because, as you said, it's like if, if Georgia is really deficient in the policies that it uses to uh, combat the epidemic, well, guess what? People from Georgia travel elsewhere and that hurts everyone. So it's pretty clear that A, first just not having states that are doing a terrible job <laughs> combating the epidemic would be beneficial. Second, there's all these questions about how to allocate scarce resources. So right now, because of the lack of federal response, we have a massive shortage of protective equipment. And so we need to, you know, we need to allocate that to the places that need it most. The federal government could be enormously helpful there. The federal government could also be enormously helpful in, you know, in massively subsidizing protective equipment so that we would have much more of it and massively subsidizing the development of vaccines. Like the thing that Bill Gates just did is an absolute no brainer that the federal government should have done, which is Bill Gates is like, hey, you know, we're going to build a bunch of factories for vaccines that haven't been approved yet that might be approved so that when they are approved, instead of having to wait for months to roll them out, we can manufacture them at scale. And that's the kind of thing that if we had a sane federal unified response, we would absolutely be doing. So I think the short answer is in basically every aspect of this, it would be enormously helpful if there were coordination of federal response. That seems like it's not going to happen to a meaningful degree. And so what that means is now the states have to step in and do the best they can. And maybe they can form confederations of states that will do things to try to substitute for what you would otherwise have hoped the federal government would do. Thanks. James, I'm going to come back to you because someone asked a question pointed to you, and I'm not sure that you want to answer it, have an answer for it, but I'll still give you a shot at this. And that is, and because I was asked this yesterday on Chinese TV, and it's a very relevant question, and that is, like, there's been finger pointing at China right now by some of the highest levels of our government that are looking at it and saying, you know, China started this, it's their fault, and so on. What, what role do we have uh, as educators, as uh, scholars, and as journalists to sort of educate the public about this? And is there any relevance at all as to where this starts at the moment? No. I, I, you look at, at our administrators, administration's response has been to finger point at every moment. We finger pointed uh, at states, at individual governors, at senators, at parties, at um, different countries, all different countries. Um, at, at, some, at some point, everyone has been pointed at to try to take the attention away from um, the administration itself. Now, now it's the World Health Organization. Um, I mean, everyone, <laughs> in hindsight, everyone could have done things differently, uh, certainly journalists and certainly politicians and <laughs> a lot of, uh, you know, as you're saying, um, you know, if you do things right, then your predictions end up being wrong. But the uh, pointing at someone else right now, it's just not the moment for that. We, uh, we really need to focus every, in, uh, every energy and uh, um, all our resources on uh, mobilization and informing people accurately about what lies ahead, what can be done, and um, the only reason I would think about pointing fingers is if it's of some utility in the current moment to inform who we can trust and who we and where we need to allocate our our skepticism. So uh, I, I'm sure you know for years, for decades, we're probably going to be litigating the the period of December through February 2020, um, and there'll be plenty of time for that. Um, but now is just not even the moment. And we also we'll have lots more more data that we don't even have now as soon as it, like the serology testing and all kinds of things will will tell us you know how much was actually known and shared or unknown and not shared and you know whether were there earnest cover-ups or and at what point were, could things have been done differently but the fact is the world health organization was raising alarms and we were and our administration was ignoring it for for about a month um i could go on but that i'll, I'll I'll leave it there. I know I want to ask your thoughts on this, honestly. I, I will say, with, without judgment, I will point out that the majority of new cases in South Korea 
uh, every day for the last few weeks have been uh, coming from uh, imported cases, meaning that there are people that travel back to the country or into the country. And the majority of those cases are from the United States right now. So every country, if they wanted to, could engage in blaming uh, all day long. So um, I'm going to ask a different question to uh, any one of you. Um, and this is a, a hot topic. I don't think that the, uh, the uh, participant is actually targeting the David Katz piece per se, but I'll bring it up anyway. David Katz uh, and then um, I think Tom Friedman wrote uh, a, a daily uh, op-eds in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago that suggested that there were ways that we could somehow cordon off uh, the most vulnerable in society and protect them uh, while opening up the rest of our government. And the, the participant today who's asking the question, I think is more asking, how do we do that going forward? Is there an opportunity to do that going forward? Do you see a way without having extremely broad scale um, antibody testing or really PCR testing as well on a massive level, is there any way to protect the elderly and keep them cordoned off from this short of shutting them down? And I'll start with Professor Kaplan. So my, th there's a couple of things I want to say. First is that um, if the argument, the original form of the argument was simply protect the elderly while essentially let everyone else go back and just take their chances with this thing, uh, I thought it was a terribly naive argument uh, because just not only mentioning the fact that there would of course be a lot of people getting sick in the group that was out and a lot of that disease, although not nearly as much as in the elderly, would be serious. Uh, the idea that somehow you're protecting the elderly is, is, is uh, spurious. Who works in the kitchens and nursing homes? Who cleans the rooms? Who are the orderlies and so on? They're all participants in that part of the population which would not be receiving these special protections. And so consequently, it's very, we're, we're, we're so connected that the idea that you could somehow or another completely cordon them off, short of something like having a testing regime where literally everyone coming to the door of a senior citizen's home has to have an on the spot test and you cannot take another step unless you're confirmed negative. And, and we're just not anywhere close to that. The second thing I don't think people realize is that um, what a difference it makes when you have an infection for which the population has no basic immunity. A fairly, a fairly well-informed person made the following argument to me a few days ago. They said, look, uh, Tony Fauci is saying that you should think of COVID as being 10 times, uh, a fatality rate 10 times the size influenza. Let's just accept that for the purpose of argument. So I said, so what I did was I just went back and took a look at what, how many deaths there were in the last influenza outbreak. I multiply it by 10 and that's what the number of deaths would be in the COVID outbreak. And I looked down and said, wait a minute, let me make sure I understand you. You're telling me that the fatality rate is 10 times higher. He says, yes. And I said, so you're saying that the total number of deaths in the outbreak would be 10 times as high as the total number of deaths in the influenza outbreak. And he says, yes. And I said, so you mean the same numbers of people will be infected in both outbreaks, don't you? But of course, influenza has a vaccine and 40% of adults at least get vaccinated and many kids get vaccinated too. So you not only are going to have this epidemic, but the number of people who get infected would just be so much larger than anything that we have sort of seen recently. So I, I think that this idea that somehow or another, uh, you could just let people go back to work as a living. Now, the idea of doing it in a controlled and targeted way, it's not just the population overall that has to be made safe. If you think about certain critical functions in the economy, they can be made safe too. The economy can be re-engineered in certain ways. Look, academia is the perfect example. Look what we're doing right now. Normally we stand in front of blackboards, at least I stand in front of blackboards. Maybe Jason uses a whiteboard, but anyhow. We, we, we stand and we do our stuff in person. And, and okay, there's a cost to that, as you saw at the beginning of our talk today, because I still don't know what I'm doing with this technology, but anyhow. Uh, we were able to re-engineer. It's not so easy to sit behind the laptop and make cars, okay? He can't do that. But that doesn't mean that it would be impossible for people to make cars. What do I mean? Imagine re-engineering the work processes like this. You have to have people who work in teams. The people who are going to be in a team 
they get screened. They're negative. They, they quarantine. They, they work maybe a two-week shift, something like this. There's no interaction outside of the team. They're done. You rotate the next team in. It's not as ef efficient, to be sure. It's no fun because you don't get to see your family for two weeks or something like that. But it's doable. And there are actually you know, chemical plants and other kinds of heavy manufacturing which are trying to do these kinds of things. So it's not only only the health side, although I still think that's the most important thing, there are certain parts of the economy that could really be re-engineered in a way to make work safer. I'll close by saying if your computer gets infected with a virus, one of the things you try to do is start it in safe mode. You shut down all of the functions and you just use your software to go out and find the virus and isolate it. I think the parts of the economy need to be restarted in safe mode, frankly. And, and uh, if, if, if you think about it, it's not impossible. The people who are sitting at home right now, everyone should be thinking creatively, how can we do some of these critical functions in a way which is safe? And it's not impossible, but it just requires a little bit of imagination. Let me, um, this is sort of c combining some of questions from other people right now. Uh, and, it, and it touches on what Professor Kaplan just said, and that is, I personally think, I think you'll all agree that when this is all over, society's gonna look really different. Um, can you tell me one or two things that you think are gonna be dramatically changed either in the healthcare space or in the non-healthcare space? And, uh, and give us some examples of that. I'll go back to, to Professor Kaplan at the end, but I'll give Jason and James a chance first. No, I, I, I was just going to say that everyone's gaining 10 pounds, but I'll... <laughs> Jason. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think the biggest thing is just, you know, everyone all the time is normally just super inertial for a variety of reasons, like both behavioral and also regulatory. And like in healthcare, a good example of this is telemedicine, where I think there were a bunch of regulatory barriers that were really hard to overcome that suddenly because of this crisis have been temporarily relaxed, but I think that's not going to be temporary. I think people are going to see in many cases the, um, that you know there's certain kinds of visits that are just easier and better to do as televisits. And I think this is going to be sort of the needed shock to substitute from one regime where that was really rare to another regime where that was much more common. Um, I think uh, more generally, I mean, obviously what we're doing right now, I think a certain fraction of, of meetings in the economy will now just transition to being Zoom meetings. I think that before this, there was a norm where if you talk to business people, they're like, you know, I can't trust someone unless I, you know, I meet them in person, I feel their handshake, etc. And once people get accustomed to trusting people the other way for six months, they're going to be like, that's nah, not so different. And then they're going to, now, of course, there's still going to be in-person meetings and everything. Everyone's not just going to stay in their apartment all the time. But I think to a large degree, all the things that people are trying as a result of this, a lot of them will stick and, and that's gonna be a huge change. James? Unmute. I, one day we'll go through a Zoom call without messing up the mute situation. I think what's happening is the pandemic is putting a lens to all of the issues that already existed in society and putting them into stark relief. And as we're going to see places like, uh, like jails, uh, homeless shelters, um, places where people can't social distance, um, going to be hit extremely hard. And there are already high rates of infectious diseases in incarceration facilities and, um, health is not addressed in those places in many cases um, appropriately and that effectively became part of your sentence that you were, were incurring an increased rate of risk of disease and hopefully things like that will be reconsidered and as you see New York City just released the data on who has died uh, here and it is it, it, it's double in um, black and Hispanic populations compared to white populations, um, the number of the number of deaths. So you're seeing things like uh, social determinants of health, which have obviously been a big part of public health, you know, in this sort of longer term conceptual way, especially when talking about cr chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. But um, this sort of puts it into this really narrow time frame and makes the contrast really stark in a way that will be hard to ignore. And I hope that's part of our of a total reconceptualization of how we think about how health and economics and 
uh, everything else are interwoven. And I'll let you speak to whatever you want to speak to, but I'll specifically ask you one side question to address as well. And that is, you've worked with public health authorities in the United States and elsewhere for your entire career um, and, and local authorities. How do you think that changes? Because my sense is that the bureaucracy seems to work reasonably well, but we, we probably need a little bit more uh, amplitude at the leadership level. I'm not, I'm not sure I caught the entire question, but I, you were talking about uh, the difference across the different levels, across global versus federal versus... But how do you think that's going to be different once this whole thing is over? How do you think the WHO, the CDC, and other public health authorities are going to look? What do we need to do differently in the future? Not just about a single pandemic, but coordination-wise. You know, that's, it's an interesting question. Um, CDC tends to be very reactive uh, and actually everyone in public health right now is reactive. People should have seen something like this coming. There was a time when pandemic uh, influenza planning was, was taken very, very seriously. We know that that effort was cut way back and we're paying for it now. Actually, uh, our SOM colleague, uh, colleague Eddie Pinker, uh, wrote a, a very short letter to the Wall Street Journal making exactly this point where there had been an article in the journal arguing for cost-benefit analysis and looking at trade-offs and, and, and Eddie's point was, well, what we're in now is exactly the result of past cost-benefit analyses. It's just that the valuations made in those analyses were quite different from valuations that you or James or Jason or I would make. Uh, and namely that, eh, you know, this, this pandemic stuff is kind of hypothetical off in the future. We're not going to worry about it so much. But the, I, my, my view about all of this public health preparedness stuff is that you have to think very hard about actions you can always take that build the button now. That's what I call it. I say you want to build a bunch of buttons so that when these various crises pop up, you can push them. And what I mean by building buttons? Well, you know, one button that was supposed to be built is the, is the strategic national stockpile. There's supposed to be enough ventilators and there's supposed to be enough personal protective equipment. And there, you know, there's, there's supposed to be all of this stuff. But, but that stockpile was largely oriented towards bioterrorism and was largely oriented towards making sure there were the right antibiotics for uh, anthrax, for example. And, and, but look where we are. Uh, it turns out that the demand is for a totally different resource. Uh, the idea uh, of going through the whole bioterror, uh, bioterror, uh, bioterror preparedness business was the importance of being able to very, very quickly put vaccination clinics together and, and process large percentages of the population in a very short period of time. It's sort of the same thing we do on election day where, you know, half the country votes on one day. Um, and, and, and have capacity like this built up so you could use it in, in different situations. I think so much of, of what's happening now is that people find themselves knowing what they'd like to do, but not having the capacity to do it. Testing is by far the most important one. And then as you start trickling down into the local towns, I mean, look, New Haven is about the only city in Connecticut which is doing any kind of contact tracing, just to give you an example. And one of the reasons they're able to do contact tracing is because of very generous of volunteerism from faculty at the School of Public Health and students in the School of Public Health and the medical school. So we're actually helping the city uh, do contact tracing and other towns aren't doing it at all. This is sort of the most basic thing you can do in an outbreak uh, and, and it's missing. Why? Because the capacity isn't there. So uh, if there's a lesson to be learned here, uh, I'd like to think that people should really take more seriously these planning exercises where you think, what are the threats to public health out in advance, they're plausible. They're not, you know, I'm not suggesting we're gonna be invaded from Mars, but, but uh, and, and to build up those capacities, that to me is I think a big lesson. I wanna thank all of our speakers today. I wanna to thank the many participants that joined us today. We'll hopefully do this again in a few weeks and we hope uh, that all of you can stay safe, continue to social distance and, uh, and be kind to one another. Take care, bye-bye.